welcome to another exciting episode in this series on animal physiology. I began this series by talking about animal development and very general aspects of animal physiology. Then I talked about animal hydration, how animals need water, and how their body uses and processes water. Today, I'll be exploring animal nutrition. I'll be talking about how animals acquire and utilize the nutrients that they get from their food, whether that food is the green, fiber-rich biomass of a plant, or the bloody, protein-rich biomass of a prey animal. All animals need food, because food provides the physical biomatter that can be integrated into the animal's body. Food provides the nutrients used not just to grow and build new tissue, but to sustain what already exists, to engage in cellular metabolism and basal regulatory processes. Food and nutrients are required to fuel growth spurts and to sustain life, and the requisite energy needs, the animal's uh, calorie needs, this determines what the animal eats and how much of it it eats from day to day. This is all very important, because some larger animals need to eat thousands of calories, or many pounds of food every day, just to maintain their body mass. Smaller animals with uh, higher metabolic rates typically burn a tremendous amount of calories, and they also require a large quantity of food relative to their body size. Other organisms, like reptiles, are cold-blooded, and they have relatively low metabolic rates. These organisms can survive by eating just a single meal every few days, or even every few weeks. In cases where organisms don't get enough food, where they're, they're starving, they may get increasingly desperate, but more and more exhausted, to the point that they don't even have the energy to capture food if they tried. These animals that get stuck in this predicament become doomed to starvation unless something edible literally drops dead right in front of their face. All organisms need certain amounts of chemical energy, and certain amounts and types of nutrients. All animals have the capability to digest their food, and turn the nutrients into usable chemical building blocks. For example, humans have the genes for the enzymes to synthesize 12 amino acids. Amino acids are used to build proteins. However, there's 20 amino acids total. There's 20 amino acids to make the full complement of human proteins. And so we have to get these other eight amino acids from our diet, from the foods that we eat. And because we need to have these in our diet, these eight amino acids are called essential amino acids, because you need them in your diet to stay healthy. In all animals, all kinds of essential nutrients, not just amino acids, but Everything that can't be synthesized by the body has to be obtained by eating other organisms. In addition to amino acids, animals also need stuff like vitamins, minerals, and electrolytes. Vitamins are carbon-containing compounds that the body needs in trace amounts, so very small quantities are able to keep an animal healthy. Minerals are inorganic substances that are used for structural or enzymatic purposes like the calcium phosphate in your bones, or the iron in the hemoglobin in your blood cells. Electrolytes are a subset of minerals, as these are mineral ions that are involved in water balance. Think something like uh, sodium ions, potassium ions, and chloride ions. These are pumped across membranes so as to set up concentration gradients, and they're pumped into or out of cells to influence osmolarity in the osmotic gradient. Now that I've gotten the context established, it's time to begin the journey through the digestive system to experience what it's like to be a piece of food consumed by an animal and to learn how food gets broken down and absorbed into the animal's body and used to make more biomass. The very first step in this journey is the mouth. All food must enter the digestive system through the anterior orifice, the jaw, the maw, the mouth. Despite its relatively simple purpose, the structure of the mouth varies wildly across the animal kingdom, because there's just so many different techniques for acquiring and handling food. 
In the episode introducing this series, I briefly talked about these different feeding techniques, but I didn't really go into too much detail. So I'll touch on that topic again in greater detail right now. I first mentioned filter feeding, which is a method wherein a scoop or a gulp of some kind of food-containing matrix is brought into the mouth and filter structures are then used to separate the inedible soil or waste material, you know, the inedible matrix, from the actual food items that are suspended within it, and these food items, once they've been filtered and collected, are then ingested. For example, baleen whales will take a huge gulp of their food-containing matrix. They'll take a huge gulp of ocean water. Then they use their tongue to push the water out of their mouth and the water flows through these giant hairy teeth called baleen. And the krill and the shrimp and all the little things that the whale eats, they all get caught on this baleen. And so they get left behind as this organic krill residue on the inside of the baleen. And then the whale just licks it clean and swallows its food. Similarly, whale sharks do the same thing when they filter feed on plankton. Flamingos also filter feed as they take scoops out of the mud and strain out brine shrimp. Sponges use their system of pores and channels to increase surface area to strain food particles out of the water. Besides filter feeding, there's deposit feeding, or the eating of detritus, which involves moving along the floor of an environment through these accumulated layers of dead and decaying organic matter and eating that for food. The detritus is literally consumed in chunks or pieces or discrete mouthfuls and broken down during the detrivore's digestive process, or in the case of fungus, it gets broken down and then absorbed. The end result of this digestion produces a excrement that is nutrient-rich soil. These kind of deposit-feeding animals include slugs and sea cucumbers, wood lice and earthworms, and other such scum-sucking, bottom-feeding critters. Then there are the fluid feeders, which literally get all of their nutrients by sucking up or absorbing the nutrient-rich and often sugar-rich fluids secreted by other organisms, uh, most typically like a flowering plant. Hematophages are animals that feed off of the blood of other organisms, so this includes animals like parasitic worms and arthropods, as well as lampreys, vampire finches, and vampire bats. These are fluid feeders, but they feed off of the fluid that exists in the bodies of other organisms. It's pretty hardcore. Now on the other end of the hardcore spectrum, you have nectarivores, which consume the sugar-rich nectar of flowering plants. So these are like moths, bees, hummingbirds, and a few species of bats. And these try and dip their heads or their proboscis in the flower to suck up all that sugar-rich nectar. The final technique for food consumption is brutish and violent. It's called mass feeding, and it involves the animal literally tearing pieces of flesh off of the body of its prey. Herbivores will bite and chew the leaves of plants, which causes stress to the plants because their, their tissue is literally getting ripped apart. Their leaves, which are valuable sugar factories that took, you know, uh, some amount of energy and carbon investment to grow in the first place, these just get ripped off and ground up and destroyed. Meanwhile, carnivores will catch a prey animal, and they'll use their fangs, their teeth, and their claws, you know, to tear the meat off of its bones. Depending on the predator, the death of the prey animal is not necessarily a prerequisite for the predator beginning to eat. Mass feeders consume their biomass with mouth parts that are shaped for their kind of prey. Herbivores typically have broad, flat teeth. And these are really useful for grinding up leaves and plant matter, you know, just grinding them into a paste and just completely destroying them. Herbivorous insects have sharp edged mandibles that they use for cutting bits of leaf or flower apart into smaller, chewable, or more dissolvable pieces. Carnivores typically have much sharper teeth, which they use to pierce and slice and tear at the flesh of other animals. Some carnivores, like leatherback sea turtles, have evolved projections growing out of the inside surface of their mouth and throat. These projections are like small little thorns, and they all point down the animal's throat. Any prey animals that get swallowed alive will struggle to escape, 
but these inward pointing barbs will dig into their body and prevent them from going backwards. Think of like a fish that gets swallowed whole by a leatherback sea turtle. It'll struggle and flop around and try and swim backwards, but it'll get hooked. All of its scales will get caught and stab onto these thorns, and the fish is doomed. Among fish themselves, the shape of the teeth varies greatly depending on the prey. Fish that eat algae typically have a kind of longer, flat teeth, with wide, flat surfaces that are perfect for scraping up and then compacting algae. Fish that eat shelled animals, like snails, have to break the shells so as to get to the soft meat inside. And so their teeth are cylindrical, with little, shallow, pointed tips, so as to apply maximum pressure. The fish that eat other fish have sharp, spiny teeth, and these are optimized for tearing apart scales and ripping up fish meat. In some species, the morphology of the mouth has evolved into an extreme, like snakes whose mouths can unhinge to consume pieces of food larger than the snake's head, or birds with disproportionately large beaks, or animals like penguins and hagfish that have jaws with multiple rows lined with little sharp teeth. However the animal does it, they acquire food, and this food ends up in their mouth. In animals, the mouth is more than just the entry point into the digestive system. It's the first stage for digestion itself. Pretty much all mass feeders have some kind of teeth, and these teeth are used to not just take chunks off of the prey or to bring food into the mouth, the teeth are used to mechanically degrade and soften and break apart the food into smaller pieces. This mechanical destruction of the food makes it significantly easier to digest by increasing the surface area available to react with digestive enzymes. Some of these digestive enzymes are secreted in the mouth. They're, they exist in the saliva, and so they soak into the food as the animal chews it and breaks it apart. For example, humans express salivary amylase in their mouth when they eat food. It's, it's in your saliva. The salivary amylase is able to break down larger carbohydrates, and it can break them down into simpler sugars. The easiest way to test this out for yourself is to find a cracker or a piece of bread and simply put it on your tongue. It will taste starchy at first as you taste the larger carbohydrates, but the amylase will hydrolyze the starches and break them down into sugars. And after a few moments, after a few seconds, the cracker or the bread will begin to taste kind of sweet as all of these sugars start to appear. We humans also express an enzyme called lingual lipase, which basically does the same thing, but to lipids. It begins the digestion of fats by breaking triglycerides down into diglycerides and fatty acids. So after handling the food with the mouth, after chewing and softening with enzymes, the food is swallowed. From this point on, the swallowed mass of food is called a bolus. The ground-up mass of leaf tissue swallowed by a little lizard is a bolus. So is the fish that gets killed and eaten by a sea anemone. And so is the shredded, bloody mass of lamb meat in the throat of a lion. Even the nectar flowing down the gullet of a hummingbird can be called a bolus. This is basically just the ingested mass of food. So anyway, this bolus will be carried down the esophagus, which is a, a muscled tube. It'll be moved partly through gravity, and partly through some kind of peristaltic motion. In humans, this is performed by the smooth muscle tissue that wraps around the esophagus. In general, uh, the esophagus in animals is part of the tube that connects the mouth to the stomach. In many animals, the esophagus is a relatively simple tube that just tunnels deep into the literal belly of the organism. But in other animals, like in most vertebrates, this little segment of the digestive tract it has to coexist and cooperate with respiratory organs, like a trachea and a windpipe. Animals that have this physiological setup where their esophagus is joined with their trachea and it makes a single chamber or a single corridor, these animals with a conjoined esophagus and trachea are at risk of suffocation by choking on their food. In many species of bird, the esophagus has a pseudochamber, which is like a widened segment that forms a little pseudo-cavity. This empty space in the throat is called a crop, and the bird uses it to store food. 
and it also uses it to regulate the flow of food down into the stomach. This is helpful because it allows the bird to gather and hold a lot of food at once, and then fly away somewhere safe to digest it all. In some species, the crop even acts as a mini-stomach, or a second mouth, where certain kinds of digestive enzymes get released so as to soften up the food and prep it for further digestion. The earliest animal digestive systems are called incomplete digestive tracts, because they consist of a gastrovascular cavity that's just a single stomach and esophagus region, and only one orifice. In these animals, the, their mouth and their anus, it's the same orifice. Food comes in and waste goes out from the same opening. These are animals like sea anemones and jellyfish. In jellyfish, this opening is at the bottom of the main body structure, and it's surrounded by tentacles. The tentacles hang down and drape through the water behind it, and they can come into contact with and capture food. And then the tentacles bring the food into the mouth, where it goes into the gastrovascular cavity, and then it gets dissolved. Nutrients are absorbed, while wastes are retained inside of this cavity until they can get released through the same opening that the food originally came in. Naturally, if there are incomplete digestive systems, then there are complete digestive systems. A complete digestive system is a one-directional digestive tract. It has a single opening in the front, which is the mouth, and a single opening at the end, which is the anus. The vast majority of animals have a complete digestive system, because a complete digestive system provides numerous advantages over an incomplete system. For example, if the mouth doesn't have to double as an anus, the mouth can then specialize for eating particular food sources. It can grow teeth and fangs and stuff, and this encourages diversification and adaptation to various niches, which then promotes ecological development. This also allows larger masses of food to be eaten, and it allows the mouth itself to become a weapon, or a tool for handling items, just like the animal's paws, or tentacles, or an elephant's trunk, or something. For that matter, the specialization of the mouth as distinct from the anus also led to the development of a, a tongue. The tongue aids in digestion, it aids in the mechanical manipulation and the tasting of the food. But in some animals, the tongue is co-opted as a means of producing noises. And in, uh, in humans, the tongue is dexterous enough that it can be used to enunciate a wide range of sounds, which humans use for language and for articulating abstract thought. Okay, so a moment ago I said the complete digestive system was one-directional. And this quality offers an advantage all within itself. A one-way digestive tract means that you can continuously eat, as you can continuously input, process, and excrete food, as opposed to having these alternating intervals or these alternating periods between feeding and excreting waste. This is how animals with an incomplete digestive system have to do it, because they take in food, they eat, but then as they digest their food, that waste stays in the cavity, and they have to wait until they digest everything to release that waste. And while all of that's going on, they can't eat more food. So they're kind of at a disadvantage, because if they come across food while they're still digesting a previous meal, they might lose that most recent meal, and that can be dangerous. You know, you don't know when your next meal is going to come from, if you're a sea anemone just hanging out on a coral reef somewhere. Now building off of this, a one-way digestive tract shuttles the bolus along a linear tract, which can be segmented and divided into discrete compartments or chambers. Various chemical solutions involved in digestion can be isolated to a compartment, and the bolus basically goes through the opposite of an assembly line. The digestive tract is like a deassembly line, where the bolus is chemically softened and dissolved, and the resulting nutrient-rich goop gets absorbed. This can happen optimally if the bolus is being passed along a sequential series of digestive steps, each one taking place in a discrete compartment that's been evolutionarily specialized for some specific aspect of complete digestion. And by moving along the tract and going through all these different chambers, all the little different parts of digestion can be fully taken into account. The whole process can be completed. Now this is where the stomach comes in. The stomach is a large bag of smooth muscle, sealed with two powerful sphincter muscles at the top and bottom, and it's lined with rapidly reproducing epithelial cells, like parietal cells that secrete an acidic gastric juice 
into the stomach cavity. When food comes into the stomach, a few cells will produce and release a hormone that's called gastrin. And gastrin will then stimulate these parietal cells to produce the stomach acid. The layers of smooth muscle that wrap around the stomach will flex and ripple, which mechanically stirs the contents of the stomach, churning the food as it rests in a pool of acid. This stomach acid is composed mostly of hydrochloric acid. There's a few other acids, but it's mostly HCl. And this activates a protein called pepsinogen. The low pH inside of the stomach is like a safety trigger that activates pepsinogen and turns it into pepsin. And pepsin is an enzyme that breaks down the peptide bonds between amino acid monomers. It's very important that the generation of pepsin be regulated by this pH lock, so that pepsin only exists when there's food that needs to be dissolved. Without this regulation, this safety measure, without this pH lock, pepsin would start taking apart the proteins and the healthy cells that are used to produce it. In essence, the highly acidic environment of the stomach breaks proteins up into smaller polypeptide chunks, and it also helps to kill off many kinds of pH-sensitive bacteria that come in with the food. And the whole process is pH-regulated, so that you don't accidentally have your stomach acid dissolving the inner lining of your stomach. Now, all animals need proteins, but they often get their proteins from different sources. For example, a carnivore is going to eat the body of another animal, and this animal's body is going to be packed with protein. So it makes sense that the predator would have a, a stomach that can specialize in breaking peptide bonds and cutting proteins into little polypeptide chunks. However, other animals don't usually eat food that's rich in protein, and this includes a lot of herbivores. The plants that the herbivores eat possess protein, but they have relatively little protein compared to meat. The dominant chemical in plant tissue is cellulose, so herbivore stomachs have adapted to break down or deal with cellulose. Many of these herbivores, like antelope, cows, sheep, and goats, for example, are called ruminants because they possess a rumen, which is kind of like a very large stomach. But instead of secreting stomach acid, the rumen instead uses symbiotic populations of bacteria that live inside of the rumen to ferment and break down the cellulose. The rumen organ maintains an oxygen-free environment, and this oxygen-free environment enables the fermentation process because fermentation is anaerobic. The bacterial fermentation of the plant matter produces fatty acids, which then get absorbed for energy. Partially digested plant matter then gets shuttled to an adjacent cavity called a reticulum, which is much smaller than the rumen, but it generally serves the same purpose. In many animals, this reticulum is kind of like a, just a smaller little side compartment of the rumen itself. Now after dissolving in the rumen and the reticulum for a while, this uh, plant bolus will get regurgitated back into the animal's mouth, and then the ruminant animal will chew on it some more. This regurgitated, partially digested food is called cud. Chances are you've heard the phrase, chewing their cud. This phrase has various meanings, depending on the context. For example, to describe someone who really likes hearing themselves talk. And it originated with this barfed-up, half-dissolved plant food getting re-chewed and re-swallowed to ensure complete digestion. Anyway, after the rumen and the reticulum, the twice-chewed, twice-digested bolus is moved into an organ called the omosome, where some of the water and the mineral nutrients that are present in the bolus will get absorbed. Now, it's only at this point, after this involved process, that the bolus actually makes it to the ruminant's true stomach, which is called an abomasum. It's only here, in the abomasum, that the ruminant uses its own digestive enzymes to break down food, as opposed to relying on bacterial metabolism. A few minutes ago, I talked about how many species of birds have a crop, which is like a space in their throats where they can store food. There's another organ in the bird's digestive system that is kind of unique, and it's called the gizzard. The gizzard is a modified type of stomach but it doesn't use specific enzymes or symbiotic bacteria to break down food. Instead, the gizzard relies on powerful muscles and a coarse, gritty texture 
to mechanically grind away at food. Birds will often consume sand or small rocks, and these will get trapped in the gizzard, and they'll provide a gritty texture. And this gritty texture is what the bird uses to easily wear down hard foods, like seeds or animal scales. Birds utilize this kind of mechanistic organ to compensate for the fact that they can't chew. However the animal does it, be it enzymatic activity, bacterial fermentation, mechanical breakdown, or any combination of the above, small amounts of dissolved bolus will get shuttled past the stomach's lower sphincter and into the small intestine. However, the small intestine is rather delicate, and so this incoming fluid, which is called chyme, that's coming out of the stomach, it's soaked in this really acidic gastric juice. If something isn't done about this, the acids in the chyme will damage the tissue of the small intestine. In response to this problem, animals have evolved to secrete a basic chemical that neutralizes the stomach acids. In humans, the beginning of the small intestine is populated with Brunner's glands, which all have cells that secrete an alkaline solution with dissolved bicarbonate ions in it. This secretion from these Brunner's glands, in addition to similar bicarbonate released from the pancreas, neutralizes the stomach acid and protects the small intestine. If it helps you visualize this, think of it like an organ spraying water on a fire. Let me really briefly explain the environment of the small intestine, so that you understand the context of where all of this stuff is happening. The small intestine is a tubular portion of the digestive tract that's relatively long. In humans, it's 20 feet long. The length of the small intestine is important, because it's meant to increase surface area. That's the key detail that you should understand here. The key detail about the small intestine is that it has a massive surface area, so as to optimize, maximize, the absorption of nutrients. Now, you might be wondering, how is there a huge surface area on the inside of a long but narrow tube? Well, it's because the inner surface of this tube is extremely rippled, and it's covered in a carpet of protrusions. At the largest scale, the inner lining is characterized by numerous large folds and flaps, as if the lining was a fabric with a much greater surface area than the tube that it was stuffed into. This also allows the small intestine to stretch to some degree, and allow a larger mass of digested food to pass through it. Furthermore, this wavy sheet of epithelial tissue is covered in structures called villi, which are like little finger-shaped projections that poke perpendicularly out of the surface. The millions of villi poking up out of the surface of the tissue increases its surface area tremendously. And this is not just because the villi add their own little you know, column coming out with its own little bit of surface area, but it's because the villi themselves are covered in even smaller finger-like projections, called microvilli. There are billions of microvilli that wave around on the inner surface of the small intestine along the epithelial lining, and this increases its surface area by orders of magnitude more than a simple flat sheet on the inside of, of a tube would have. This massive surface area really facilitates widespread nutrient absorption, so the animal can take as much as possible out of its food. Okay, so back to the digestive process. The pancreas and the liver secrete many digestive enzymes into the small intestine, which helps with the continual breakdown of nutrients. But it's all done in a cellular environment that's a little less caustic than it is in the stomach. When food reaches the small intestine, it sends a hormone called secretin as a chemical messenger to the pancreas, telling the pancreas to deliver some of its digestive enzymes. The pancreas then produces inactive proteases, which are enzymes that break down proteins, and it releases these inactive proteases into the small intestine through the pancreatic duct. The pancreas also produces a chemical called trypsinogen, and when this is released into the small intestine, it reacts with an enzyme there called enterokinase, and this trypsinogen-enterokinase reaction produces trypsin. The enzyme trypsin then goes on to activate all of these inactive proteases. 
There's a very diverse variety of these proteases that get activated, and when this happens, they all go to work breaking down the polypeptide chunks into their amino acid monomers. Now the liver produces compounds called bile salts, which are mixed in a solution and stored in the gallbladder before getting released into the small intestine. These bile salts, contained within the slimy solution called bile, are integral for lipid digestion. Remember that lipid molecules have hydrophobic segments, and this makes it difficult for them to dissolve in an aqueous polar solution. The bile is an emulsifying agent. The bile breaks up the lipid membranes and allows them to be dissolved into smaller chunks that can be readily digested by lipase enzymes. This digestive activity breaks up the lipids into small molecules, like monoglycerides and fatty acids, and these are then easily absorbed by diffusion across the membranes of the villi and the microvilli that line the small intestine, and they go into the bloodstream, and then they can be distributed throughout the body. This digestive activity breaks up the lipids into small molecules, like monoglycerides and fatty acids, and these are easily absorbed by diffusion across the membranes of the villi and the microvilli that line the small intestine. Now once they're inside of the cells, the masses of lipids are coated with proteins, and this protein coat works kind of like a, a transport manifest, so that the incoming lipid nutrients are directed within the cell to the right place. They get shuttled to structures called lacteals, which feed the lipid nutrients into the bloodstream. Proteins and carbohydrates are also absorbed through these villi and microvilli, where they get processed and sent into the bloodstream. Proteins get broken down into amino acids, and then the cells of the small intestine end up spending ATP to actively transport the amino acids across the membrane. The same is true for carbohydrates, which get broken down into sugars, like glucose. The small intestine's epithelial cells use a sodium-potassium pump to establish a sodium concentration gradient, which then brings sodium into the cells. A co-transporter protein taps into this sodium concentration gradient by binding with a glucose molecule and a sodium ion, and then it changes conformation to move both of them into the cells. Once past the membrane, the glucose diffuses into the bloodstream, where it can then be accessed by other cells for energy or for carbon to build stuff with. It's also important to understand that as all of these solutes are absorbed into the cells, the cellular osmolarity increases, and so water will follow into the cells through osmosis. So the small intestine doesn't just absorb nutrients, it also absorbs water. After moving along the small intestine, the remaining food mass is passed into the large intestine. This is where the digestive process is clearly winding down. The vast majority of the nutrients and most of the water has been absorbed. So the large intestine's primary purpose is just to absorb any last little bits of water and any remaining ions and nutrients, and then compact the, the food into feces that's ready to be excreted. This is true not just in larger animals like vertebrates and humans, uh, it's also true in the hindgut of insects. In some species of herbivores like rabbits, elephants, horses, and some primates, the beginning of the large intestine has a sac that grows off of it called a cecum, which is like a little mini rumen. The cecum contains symbiotic bacteria and protists that help further break down cellulose. Humans also have a cecum. It's the first little pocketed area of our large intestine, and coming off of it is the appendix. The appendix isn't vital to life, which means that you can survive if it's damaged or removed but the appendix is believed to serve an important function. The appendix appears to hold a wide range of symbiotic microbes, and it works kind of like a seed vault for helping keep the intestines populated with a healthy gut biome. If the organism happens to get an infection and, say, it suffers from diarrhea, the diarrhea may flush out its gut, and it may do a lot of damage to its gut biome. And so the appendix, which acts as like a seed vault, can then reseed the intestines. It can reseed the colon and the large intestine or the small intestine with any of the missing symbiotic microbes. The final stages of digestion take place at the end of the large intestine or at the end of the hindgut. 
where the remaining biomass is generally composed of more or less pure waste. The waste is compacted, and it's compiled into a dense mass of feces, which is then removed from the body through excretion out of the anus. This whole journey represents the complete path of food as it moves through the digestive system of an animal, from recently captured prey organism ingested at the mouth, turned into a bolus, dissolved into chyme, compressed into feces, and then excreted out the other end. The process of digestion works to extract as much of the nutrients out of the food as possible. And these nutrients, be they proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, mineral ions, or whatever else, these are all allowed to diffuse into the bloodstream. The blood, or the hemolymph in the case of insects, circulates throughout the animal's body and saturates its tissues with the nutrients. The tissues, the cells that work to keep the animal alive, they all absorb these nutrients and use them to build new proteins, to make new membranes, new carbohydrates, and to do stuff that the animal needs to perpetuate itself as a healthy biochemical superstructure. All right, everyone, that is about it for animal digestion. If you're really digging this series on animal physiology, then don't miss next week's episode, which will continue the fun by exploring animal sensoria. I'll talk about all of the different kinds of sensory structures that animals have evolved to detect the world around them and to maintain an awareness of their body and their internal body conditions. I'll talk about eyes and ears, pain receptors and thermoreceptors, I'll talk about organs that sense magnetic fields. It'll get really cool. If this sounds interesting, and I really think it is, then be sure to stop by and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 